Who on earth are we? Why in heaven are we here? And how to make sense of this mess of our humanness and perhaps even transcend it. Welcome everyone to season two of Dawn of an Era of Well-Being, where we deep dive into uplift with insight, thanks to remarkably informed guests exploring the nature of our human nature and how to better engage it. If abnormal is the new normal and perceiving is the new believing, then inner is the new outer and consciousness is our new source for healing. Yet for many, it seems like anything but the dawn of an era of well-being, from pandemia to war to economic, environmental, and even democratic breakdown and more, as space exploration advances at breakneck pace, all share center stage in this overheated emotional climate our space our species struggles to navigate. So what's going on? Well, if you look at it from the outside in, it's the same old conflictual story getting rather scary. But now we're raising the bar by raising awareness that this mess of our humanness can only be resolved from the insight out, as in vision that emanates from a profound shift in perception about the world around us and within us. Precisely the thrust of Dawn of an Era of Well-Being podcast and wonderful book. I'm Alison Goldwyn, and we're in a mighty discussion space featuring mighty voices of loving change, two of whom are our esteemed co-hosts, Irvin Laszlo, a two-time Nobel Peace Prize nominee, world-renowned philosopher and systems scientist, author or co-author of over 106 books, founder of the Laszlo Institute of New Paradigm Research and the Club of Budapest, and recipient of multiple honors and awards like the Goya Peace Prize, the Assisi Mandir of Peace Prize, and the Luxembourg Peace Prize. And Fred Sao, business leader, author, futurist, practitioner of Eastern wisdom and Western science, chairman of the Family Business Network's Ambassador Circle, and founder of ITEA Institute and Octave Institute, fusing ancient wisdom and quantum science as a platform for people to achieve a purposeful life, mindfully lived at new levels of consciousness and freedom. So I'm welcoming today's two dynamos, one of whom is a legend in her own time and one of whom is en route to becoming one, Jean Houston and Annalise Smitsman. Jean Houston is a world-renowned scholar, futurist, and researcher in human capacities, social change, and systemic transformation. She's one of the principal founders of the Human Potential Movement and one of the foremost visionary thinkers and doers of our time. She's also founder of the field of social artistry, human development in the light of social change. She's been a key player in the empowerment of women around the world and was awarded the Synergy Superstar Award 2020 by the Source of Synergy Foundation for her exemplary work inspiring us to source our highest human capacities. A powerful and dynamic speaker and renowned for her gifts as a mythic storyteller, Dr. Houston holds conferences, seminars, and mentoring programs with leaders and change agents Worldwide, she has worked intensively in over 40 cultures, lectured in over 100 countries, and worked with major organizations such as UNICEF, UNDP, and NASA, as well as helping global state leaders, leading educational institutions, business organizations, and millions of people to enhance and deepen their own uniqueness. She's the co-author of the number one bestsellers, The Quest of Rose and Return of the Avatars, the first two books of the Future Humans trilogy with Dr. Annalou Smitsman, and has authored over 36 published books and a great many unpublished books, plays, and manuscripts. She's Chancellor of Meridian University and has served on the faculties of Columbia University, Hunter College, Marymount College, the New School for Social Research, and the University of California. Dr. Houston was also president of the American Association of Humanistic Psychology and is presently the chair of the United Palace of Spiritual Arts in New York City. She's a member of the Evolutionary Leaders Circle of the Source of Synergy Foundation. And Dr. Annalou Smitsman, a visionary scientist, published author, futurist, system architect, and leadership catalyst for the transition to a thrivable civilization. She's founder and CEO of Earthwise Center and holds a master's degree in law and judicial political sciences from Leiden University in the Netherlands and a degree of doctor from the Maastricht Sustainability Institute at Maastricht University, also the Netherlands. A groundbreaking PhD dissertation, Into the Heart of Systems Change, addresses how to diagnose and transform key systemic barriers of our world crisis, 
through its proposed transition plan for a thrivable civilization. And Luce is the co-author also of the number one bestsellers, The Quest of Rose and Return of the Avatars. Uh, these are the first two books of the Future Humans trilogy with Dr. Jean Houston. What a coincidence. <laughs> and Luce is the author of the Amazon bestseller, Love Letters from Mother Earth, The Promise of a New Beginning, as well as many scientific publications in international peer-reviewed journals, books, educational, transformational, all of this. And Elise is the lead architect of the Earthwise Tipping Point System, the lead author of the 3.0 Educational Transformation, Transformation Blueprint. There's so much to say here. An architect of the Seeds Constitution and strategic steward of Haifa and Seeds for co-developing the regenerative Renaissance tools, currencies, systems, and cultures. And Elise is a member of the Evolutionary Leaders Circle of the Source of Synergy Foundation. Now that is a mouthful, but I'm going to give us one more little homeopathic drop before we start this show officially. I want to begin with this brief, brief excerpt from uh, Jean Houston's chapter in the Dawn of an Era of Wellbeing book, and then we will swing it over to you, Irvin and Fred. Here we go. Patterns of millennia have prepared us for another world, another time, another era. At the same time, the virus pandemic, unlike any ever known in human history or prehistory, has confused our values, uprooted our traditions, and left us in a labyrinth of misdirection. Factors unique in human experience are all around us, the inevitable unfolding towards a planetary civilization, the rise of women to full partnership with men, the daily revolutions in technology, the media becoming the matrix of culture, and the revolution in the understanding of human and social capacities. This is a good one. The zeit is getting geisty, <laughs> as in zeitgeist, as the old story itself is undergoing the sacred wound in order that it too grows and addresses the multiples of experience and complexity of life unknown to our great-grandparents. We have become so full of holes that perhaps we are well on the way to becoming holy. Holy moly, that is a wildly thrilling ride along vocabulary in the planetary from Jean Houston, genius Houston. Over to another genius, Irvin Laszlo. <laughs> well, Alison, thanks very much for these beautiful, long introductions. I think uh, the fact is that we are living in what the Chinese, and Scrat can tell you that's better than anybody, what the Chinese used to call interesting times. There are times of transformation. They are, I think, sort of christening by fire, I feel. I feel that these are times that we will remember as being the birth of a new civilization. Because if there is something that we are here to remember, that we are able to remember anything, then it means that we have come through this christening by fire. We have come through with flying colors. Because if we don't, there'll be nothing for us to remember because we won't be around. The choices between evolution and extinction. I have, and I don't want to make this long, I just want to put this on the table. I have an intuition. It's an ever firmer intuition, reconfirmed every day, that we have started on a new path and that it is the right path. It's a better path. We are rethinking the, the aberrations, the mistakes, the one way, wrong, wrong way streets that we have been going on, creating an unsustainable, unjust, and violent world on this planet. We have learned that that is not the way forward. We are learning it now. There is something in the air. Every day more people are joining. Every day there are more initiatives. They are trying to see beyond the woods, beyond the, beyond the chaos, to what lies underneath. There are reasons for this, and I can talk about it later, but I don't want to say, take the time for it now. The fact is, yeah, whether for good or for bad, I have this everyday reconfirming intuition that we are on the way to a thriving and sustainable civilization. The way is still difficult, it's still thorny, but I think people are waking up. 
There are programs like this one. There are books like The New Dawn, The Dawn of a New Era of Well-Being. There are books like my other book, The, the Upshift. And there are thousands. There's new publications coming around. And people are talking. There is something in the air. We have become a global village. Now we talk to each other. Now we realize that we are together in this. Now we know that by our voice is carried the world over. We better make it a good voice. We better join with the right people. Because then we can be that small group of people. And the great mentor of Jane Houston, Margaret Mead, has said, that we should never thought can change the world. That small group. It could be that it starts here, that it has started forming. And it's up to us to carry it forward. I'd like to hear Fred's views from the Chinese Oriental culture perspective. And then hear our guests, Anna Louise Smithman and Jane Houston, about this greatest of all questions. Well, will we make it? I think we will. What do you think? Fred, what do you think? Before we introduce our guests into the conversation, what do you think? Will we make it? Fred is arriving from the vortex. Of so course. Here he is. <clears throat> of course. Because evolution is truth. Evolution is truth, which is a perception. Everything is where it should be. Evolution never stops, but we judge good or bad. We judge chaos or order. It's always an order. The reason we perceive chaos is constantly change is the only truth in the material world. It's constantly <clears throat> recreating itself. Now we're going through a major step. Other people might call it uh, the... Uh, the second exo year, people may want to call it uh, the new calendar of humanity, or in Buddhism, it calls the new awakening 2,500 years ago. It's well said in a lot of predictions. But if you look at today, we are going through a major transformation of major awakening. And the challenge inform how we evolve. I mean, evolution biologist knows that the challenge is the direction of the evolution, at least the perceived challenge. And if you look at your personal life, you always evolve against your challenge. You grow, you awaken, and you see how untrue the challenge is. It's because we have a dualistic mind of judgment of good and bad. It is what it is. Everything is perfect as it should be. Evolution never stops. It's the human mind, of the dualistic judgment of good and bad. There is no such existence. And from a Chinese perspective, there's a calling to us to go back to the source. And consciousness is streamlined into our three callings and soul. Your individual consciousness that goes back over time that stays with you, the quantum entanglement of how it arises. There's a collective consciousness, karma, or quantum things. And then there is where we will say God's plan for us, but the evolutionary timing of where it should be. These three things talk about the three souls of the human body in the Chinese. Mm -hmm. And so it is just a different segmentation of the same consciousness, but as it go into quantum entanglement of how we need to respond to the three souls of the human being. Mm. And so, actually, there's one. But for sake of human comprehension, we split it up the consciousness as we see how consciousness gradually go into the material form and how we have now perceived it as good and bad. Evolution never stops. It is perfect always in the process. And so now we are in a really new stage of Exo era, the age of inquiries, the new Mayan calendar, the new awakening, whatever we call it. Human being is ready for a major step up of consciousness. 
Love it. Well, we're talking, in effect, about a new storyline for humanity, aren't we? And I want to bring Jean and Anna Luce into this loop now and present this thought and ask you your feelings. Increasingly, our global vernacular refers to this need for a new story for humanity, if you like, one that speaks to the new human and the truth about our expanded nature that's been sort of relegated to the backstage of life instead of center stage and, and inner stage. But if reality is merely a perception up for personal interpretation, and there are nearly 8 billion diverse human perceptions on Earth, and how in heaven do we all reach an agreement about our new collaborative storyline and the new paradigm's nature of existence? One person's fake news is another's reality. One person's Brussels sprouts is another's candy. Jean, Annalise, let us know what your thoughts are. Annalise, why don't you start? Okay, Jean. <laughs> and first of all, thank you all so much for these incredible introductions. And, you know, we are so delighted and honored to be here with all of you. Wow. Well, I, I'm not a big fan of this relative, you know, rel making everything relative, right? Relativism. Um, I think it's very dangerous. And if I look at Mother Earth, uh, <laughs> she's wonderful in reminding us that there is a consequence to action. We may believe or have a perception that interdependence is not real, but the planetary boundaries and the the thresholds that we're crossing right now uh, are really making it very, very clear uh, that independence is a reality. So in many ways, I feel that we are now starting to experience the, uh, the, the damaging flip side of a unified reality. So unified reality is not only about, oh, it's, it's amazing, this is great awakening, great enlightenment. Unified reality also means that there is a united responsibility that we need to take care of that. So if we're really, truly accepting that we are unified, that means that when we are damaging our home, right, when we are damaging our earth, the consequences there are also for life as a whole. Um, the question also, I want to just touch back a little bit earlier about will we make it, because I believe that's also important to weave into this new storyline. And, um, you know, there are a lot of old myths and old stories out there which are portraying the belief system that in order to make the jump to the new human or to make the jump to the, the, the prophesized new era that we have to go through an apocalypse. Uh, and I think that's a very dangerous narrative. Um, we can also see that there are, there's a great radicalization happening right now and people are almost believing that there is a purpose to violence, purpose to breakdown. I'm hearing this so much. You know, I've just come back from my trip to the Netherlands and in Europe and been in conversation. And so many people have asked them, do you believe a breakdown is necessary for a breakthrough? They're saying, yes, systems have to break down. All the old orders have to break down. Well, I believe that is exactly the narrative that brings us into trouble because there's an underlying justification there of violence, of more disruption. For me, this, this new narrative of our interdependence and our unity is to really um, evolve by choice rather than by default. <laughs> because it seems that if we are evolving by default, <laughs> we're taking the most painful route uh, because that is often the kind of evolutionary trajectory uh, where nature puts a stop <laughs> to certain experiments and then says, okay, let's, let's start in the next uh, stage, but uh, sometimes indeed through a, through a breakdown. So for me, the new narrative of this interdependence, uh, our unity, um, and therefore also will we make it, is this greater collective awakening um, to say, yes, we're going to evolve by choice, consciously understanding that we are part of a larger planetary consciousness. We really are one species. And that the, the, the primary motivation of that is the deep appreciation and love for each other and for our planet, understanding that if we don't, what, what we will lose is just phenomenal. That this really has to be the choice. This is truly our heart's desire <laughs> uh, is to make it work together. Mm. I love that, Jean. I love this, this idea of conscious consciousness. <laughs> Jean, your thoughts. 
I think. Whenever, whenever I'm given an impossible question, <laughs> I always fall back on poetry, at least because it gets me going. And I think of the lines of the poet who said, um, the human heart can go to the lengths of God. Dark and cold we may be, but this is no winter now. The frozen misery of centuries cracks, breaks, begins to move. The thunder is the thunder of the flood, the flow, the upstart spring. Thank God our time is now when wrong comes up to meet us everywhere, never to leave us till we take the longest stride of soul folk ever took. Affairs are now soul size. The enterprise is exploration into God. What are we making for? It takes so many thousand years to wake. But will you wake for pity's sake? Oh, I really believe that this is the great time of awakening. If I were to put it in a certain kind of biological, technological, I'd say it is the time of, uh, well, in one of my books, I called it jump time, where we release a lot of the old forms and we are straight ahead into something wondrous new that we've been preparing for, I would say, for thousands of years. I think we are on the brink of a renaissance. I love the Italian word for the rinascita, rinascita. It's a kind of <laughs> radical birthing on the part of the population of the earth. Um, I'm looking at my five-month-old puppy uh, here, and uh, she is so inventive, and I've just seen her put together things that I thought were impossible to put together. And, and she's full of joy and expectation. And is it radical innocence or is it radical breakthrough? I think that we are in a stage of um, speciation. Speciation, you know, the biological term by uh, those who study fossils, fossils, and they look the same, they look the same, over the hundreds of years, suddenly, boom, they speciate. Something new happens. And often it happens in the midst of colossal release and breakdown. We're seeing it as breakdown. It may be release. And what happens in that time of release, you look at the 15th century Renaissance in Europe, preceded by a pandemic that killed half of Europe and the Middle East. We are in a similar stage with the breakdown of all the traditional ways of knowing, being, seeing, loving, trying, exploring. And what is also arising, and I see this, I mean, I've been looking at human beings, taking depth, depth soundings of the human psyche for a great many years. And it is not exactly the same psyche as it was 50 years ago when I began. There are imaginal cells coded with profoundly new ways of being, thinking, seeing, dreaming. And what I see is, it is as if a speciation is taking place in the depths of the psyche <clears throat> that invariably brings on the great breakdowns in order so that we can have the extraordinary breakthroughs. And that is what I believe is happening, speciation. We are in an evolutionary jump time and not just a time of disaster. But most people have never thought or lived in an evolutionary jump time. How do we prepare ourselves for such an extraordinary occasion? And I believe, dear, dear Irvin, you are way out in front. You are a pioneer of the understanding and the specificities that are required in your new work about how we actually begin to have the uplift, the breakthrough. In my own small way, I've tried to do this in a whole lot of places. And I find that people are ready. They are anxious. So many people are on the cusp of the change. Explorations into the universe, explorations into God, explorations into 
profoundly new ways of being, thinking, having, loving, seeing. That I am one of the few who is hopeful. But you can only be hopeful by being helpful. I was a Girl Scout for many, many years. I sometimes think I owe everything that I am to having been a Girl Scout. You know, every every weekend we would go into forests and we would clean things up and we would we would uh, uh, we, we would understand the whole nature of nature. And then when we went back, we would work in the lighthouse for the blind. We would work down in the Bowery with people who had fallen into utter distress. So we were working with nature and we were working with people. And that was Girl Scouting back there in the 1950s. You know? And I, I really think that we need a new kind of scouting. Take the young people who have not fallen apart yet, who have not been dis diseased, diseased by the profound unknowns that hit them every day and begin to bring them back into nature as nurturers, as planters, as seeders of the new seasons. Let them learn how to work with the breakdown of belief, the breakdown of culture. Teach them ways in which they themselves can recultivate themselves so that they can cultivate the world. I, I am all for uh, clubs of compassion, clubs of co-creation, clubs of kindness. Young people, and sometimes the very old, people my age, you know, and urban. This is the, because this is beautiful, beautiful, please continue. Well, this is just what I'm seeing. I, I really believe that the clubs of conscientiousness really have to start now. With young, the young and the old somehow getting it all together. And somehow the middle will eventually catch up. But there's just so much that we can do with Mother Earth and Mother Earth with us. To be in the, within and with the Earth is to be charged. It is to become a member of Earth mind, soul mind. It is to grow. So I think in times of speciation is also parallel times of new ways of being, of growth, of co-creation. Mm -hmm. And that is why I'm hopeful. And I will do my darndest to follow through on whatever it is that I've been saying for the last few minutes. <laughs> Sometimes it comes out spontaneously when you're put on the spot and you discover what you really know and what you really have to do. Thank you. The best Thank you. kind, the best and the most genuine and uh, thrilling and uplifting. And I want to mm. swing it over to you, Irvin, because yes. uh, this reminds me a little bit. We had uh, your friend Deepak Chopra on recently, and the word midwife came up, that we're almost midwifing a birth on earth, because I know Anna Luce is talking about maybe not mm. breakdown for breakthrough, but more of this midwifing a new a future human, I think you relate to that. And, you know, mo all of us come into this world and experience a birth, a first birth. But this is a very unique time in history where we're now experiencing a conscious second birth. This is quite different. Irvin, would you like to talk to us a, a little bit about the dynamic of consciously birthing oneself when we already arrived here just seemingly by hazard, although... That's up for discussion. Well, we have got here midwives, and we have got here Girl Scouts. <laughs> and I think we need more Girl Scouts like this so that they could help us bring birth to the new world, which is in us. That's the wonderful thing, that it is not artificial. We have done about now, I think it's time to realize this, all the synthetics. Nowadays, when a product is really forward-looking, then it says it doesn't have, it says without, you know. Before it used to say with, with, with. Now it's <laughs> learned, we better do away. Be more simple, be more basic. Get back to nature. Get back to who we are. 
we are not separate. We are part of a larger reality. This is what Jean is saying. This is what Anna Luce is saying. This is what Fred is saying. And I think this great return to reality, return to the, to the system of life on Earth. We are yeah. not just a conscious species, a separate species. We are part mm -hmm. of the web of life on this planet. And our criterion, our that time and date line must be what is good, what is thriving for nature, for life on the planet. That is what is good for us. And this return, this tapping the source, this reconnecting with what there is around us, or what who we really are. That is it is what is happening, I think. And it's wonderful because we have all the tools, we have the information systems. We have the instruments to read, to, to experience the smallest reality that's beyond our, our eyes, the largest reality that's beyond us as well, and the other perceptions. We are beginning to see really beyond our body who we really are. An evolving world. Evolution, as Fred says, never stops. It didn't stop. But individual elements that are within this great wave of evolution have the choice, very often that bifurcation choice, evolve with the rest or say goodbye and leave the stage. We can become extinct. As we know, the overwhelming majority of, of, of higher species on Earth have become extinct. The sixth great extinction that I was mentioning that is on us. So it's nothing surprising if we would leave the stage. But I think it's, it won't happen. Why? Because we have this fantastic element, which we call consciousness, which is something which is ability to perceive, to feel, and to make sense of what we feel and what we perceive. And then we can finally come to our senses come to realize that we have experimented way beyond our capacities, gone way beyond what is nature. Everything is artificial, everything is, is synthetic. What we eat, what we dress, how we talk to each other. I mean, it's, it's time to get back, not to something primitive, but to something which is really true and, and valid, which is divine simplicity, an evolving system of which we are a part. We are evolving systems ourselves. And Jean is a, is a scout, a girl scout of this system, joining with other girls and boys to, to bring this system to fruition. And Anna Luz is, and Deepak, as you mentioned, we are talking about being midwives. Surely we have in us, we have it in us to change. We have it in us to change the world because we are not changing in any haphazard, arbitrary manner. We are changing it to what it really truly is, a world of life thriving on this planet. That is our compass. And thanks to you and all of us and the, all of you on this program and this whole series and similar series like this podcast, that finally we are beginning to realize this and we are beginning to talk about it to talk about these things and take it seriously, not just saying that's wild imagination, just high in the sky. We are now beginning to take it seriously. And that's how we will start changing. We take ourselves changing seriously and ourselves, the new us. That's what you're about to leave by. Thanks for your attention. Oh, Urban, thank you so much. I want to bring in our Boy Scout and midwife, Fred Sau, and ask you, Fred, how do we marry what Irvin has just termed divine simplicity with the advent of AI and this explosion of quite thrilling but quite daunting technology? Well, first of all, I want to take off about birth and midwife um, and go back to... Um, the worldview of quantum paradigm, that everything is a projection on a holographic reality. And that everything's greater from consciousness 
as a projection. And so you can look at the metaverse and technology. It is a projection that create another projection, a holographic reality that create a mirror to mirror this holographic projection. So what quantum science has done is bridge between physics and metaphysics and really understand the reality from that angle. Now we all know that culture create from worldview. We see Christianity, Islam, Buddhist, Hinduism, Judaism. It's through the worldview, how we see it, we create the rest. Now, unlike the last Renaissance, it is from a spiritual religious era that the nature of freedom makes us to revolt from arts that bring about the uh, age of enlightenment, the scientific revolution, which is a material scientific revolution that brings into industrialization where we took today, materialism. This time, like every cycle of birth and rebirth, it is a reverse. This time, I believe the Renaissance is about economics. It's about materialism. And today, we look at a challenge is an issue that is about ethics. Now, Adam Smith have one, freedom is a driving force. Why is it freedom? Because we're one, together. We're born to be free. And but however, with the theory of moral sentiments and the wealth of nations, now can replace with a theory of consciousness and a new economic integration which is always the truth about evolution. We always integrate to more complex structure to mimic the reality of holism. And so this one will be inst instigated by the challenge of economic revolution, a new theory. Now we haven't had any normative economics for a long time. Everything's talk about donut economy, narrative economy, Nature economy, it's really talking about much more minute structure of assumption of human nature. And so this one brings about the quantum paradigm. And you can see it, the United Nations instigate. We need a new paradigm of economics that's based on well-being and happiness, because that's what we want. And we need to move from GDP to GHP. Now, after... 10 years and 10 reports, Ignatz got any anywhere. He had no idea what well-being is. Because the guy who does the research is the same guy for 10 years. And as Einstein said, you cannot solve the problem you created with the same level of consciousness. So now we need an economic revolution to bring ethics back, to bring a new concept of freedom that is holistic, to bring materialism. And the result is very simple. Well-being and happiness is not a journey of acquiring and production as we see it today. It's a journey of finding who you are to be co 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 coherent as a scientific of who you are, to find who you are, live an authentic life, and to find happiness. Happiness and well-being is a journey inside. Now, the journey inside is a journey of consciousness shift. So now all of a sudden the journey outside of material acquisition will change into a spiritual journey of consciousness and the journey inside. So now the reverse, like cycles, the reverse is now from materialism, a journey of external to a journey of internal. And when you try to find happiness, you find out who you are. You have to answer the existential question, what I am, where do I come from and what the hell am I doing here? And this is the new renaissance. What a this story. It's a new era. Thank Indeed. you. Indeed. Be beautifully said, Fred. So swinging it back to Jean and Anna Luce, I I'm going to read one more brief quote from the book from, from Jean because it is an interesting and relevant dynamic. 
Jean, you write, the wounding pathos of our own local story contains the seeds of healing and even of transformation. This is an often told truth and is woven into all classic tales of the human condition. Witness the Greek tragedies in which the gods force themselves symptomatically into consciousness at the time of wounding. All myth, in fact, has wounding at its core. Pathos gives us eyes and ears to see and hear and feel what our normal eyes and ears and feelings cannot. So my question, if we're thinking in kind of cinematic terms about life on earth and beyond, if consciousness is our producer and inner director, and everyone and every being are the co-stars, but the human ego has been rewriting and usurping the show, then is it our wounding that ultimately yells cut to avert Act 3 finale? And will our wounding yell cut in time this time? Jean, Annalise, who would like to answer or pivot off of that? You know, all great stories contain wounding as a major part of the story. Because wounding releases us to see things, uh, to see things with the kind of wisdom that comes from pathos, that comes from the sense of rejection by the local cosmos, you know. And I think that's what lots of us are feeling. But at the same time, we have something that in the past, let's say, renaissances did not have. We have television sets. We have information bombarding us all the time so that there's almost no time for reflection. Having lost the genius of reflection, people turn to uh, mountebanks, to um, beings who really do not have their own consciousness of their soul and thus have to project ego out upon the masses to attract them. I mean, this has happened over and over. This is not a new phenomenon at all. How do we get back to the imagination? Because the imagination also comes out of the imaginal. In the imaginal are the deep, coded, potent forms from which evolution then proceeds, you see. Now, I would suggest that we need a new imaginal renaissance. <laughs> um, Plato talks about the idos, the idos, the divine ideas that are behind everything. And that when you get to the idos and you begin to wander in the halls of the idos, the divine ideas, you are reawakened, you are re-quickened you suddenly know with a knowing that transcends all your old scholarship. The universe is there. And of course, the new cosmology says that we are the latest product, not just of the metabolism of the galaxy, but we are in fact the galaxy, no, the galaxy. we are the cosmos itself put into a biodegradable space-time suit. <laughs> what an incredible vision. <laughs> so this, this gives us this gives us the portent of the the portent of where we yet may go in the next few years. Because you know, from my having traveled so much and being around so many different kinds of people, something is turning. Something is moving in an evolutionary song that is bringing us into the next part of what we have been coded, with whom, with what we have been coded. I really believe that we are coded beings, and historical circumstances are some of the best way to awaken that coding and seeing it all over. And it doesn't get any uh, press, which is probably a good thing, because if it got press, it would be compromised and do all kinds of silly uh, soap operas. But uh, I, I just believe that we are in a state of a great awakening of the depths of our humanity, which takes us, again, exploration into God, exploration to the cosmos that is shaking within us or shaking us and saying, hey, time to wake up now. The long sleep is over. 
I, I strongly suggest or suspect that Irvin believes, <laughs> agrees with me on this because I've gotten so many of my good ideas from him. What do you think, Irvin? Do you think that you I, are? I think you're right on the bottom, my goodness. We are coded beings because we are children of the universe. And this is a coded universe. The coded universe, yes. It's not an impersonal anything goes universe. It's a universe that's directed toward coherence, toward complexity, joined with simplicity. It's coded for life, for the larger systems of life, for coherence and for striving. The galaxies move in that direction, from the initial chaos to move towards coherence, bit by bit. Einstein, I think, said at one point, the most amazing, miraculous fact is that this universe is understandable to some extent at all, you see, because it's coherent to some extent. We are part of this tremendous evolutionary wave of which you are talking now, which was Fred was talking about, evolution has never stops. And Anna Lewis was talking about, and you are talking about. I think it's well to learn. This is not an anything goes universe, and it's not an impersonal, not impersonal universe that can go in any direction at all. It has coding. It has a preferred direction. It's moving toward coherence and oneness. And when we are part of that, and we realize that we are part of that, then we feel what people, awakened people today, call love. One of the most important words and concepts that you could, you could come up. All the great scientists, all the great philosophers, all the great spiritual people, when they come to the bottom line, what there is and what there needs to be done is to live, experience, and work with others for love, being us, bringing us together. The, the electron lo loves its nucleon. Mm -hmm. And the hydrogen loves the, 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 the uranium or the whole element over, over across the entire scheme of the, of the atomic uh, table of contents, the, the, the forms. So this is a universe moving towards oneness. It's moving towards oneness with love. Because those who are in this universe feel love. Those who are really in it. I think the blade of grass feels the equivalent of love. It feels its connection to the other bits, one tree to the others, one species swimming in the sea to alter the other species. And here is one species who has somehow opted out of this, and it's time for it to get back into it. Feel unconditional, unconditional and mm. unrequited, unrequited, but profound and self-initiated love for all things. Asking too much is the minimum. It's what we need to make mm -hmm. it on this earth, yes. to love each other and be kind to each other, live with each other, know that we are one. You are saying that, Jean, you have always said that, and we're very grateful to you for that. Fred was saying it's from the quantum paradigm perspective. I call it the new paradigm. It's the same as Fred is talking about. We joined uh, on this. I think we are moving toward a new paradigm where love is the key to coherence and to hear coherence is the key to life. Beautiful. Anna Luce, then I want you to elucidate something because I love the direction that this is going and the idea that of, of a coded universe and how to explain, um, all right, is the current state of the human condition, mm -hmm. so conditioned to drama, almost like an extreme sport, that the rush that it's been giving us of feeling our own vitality and existence has now become addictive? H how do we wean ourselves off of this insidious grip? Or was that also part of our coding, that we had to go through that addiction? And now we're, we're responding to this next coding in us of coming off of it. What do you think? <laughs> well, I'd like to weave a couple of things together. <laughs> and then through that, organically, I will come to your questions. So first of all, um, to me, when people are caught up in a drama cycle, 
but very often they're they're actually not present and aware in the subtle dimensions and the subtle consciousness. Uh, hence this addictive pattern. And often we see that people just need um, harder and harder stimulus uh, in order then to feel their existence. Now, for coming back to your earlier question about the wounding, I believe it's precisely that is the problem. So we've so long believed that wounding was necessary, and perhaps there were earlier stages where the wounding was necessary, but we have mythologized wounding to such an extent. And then, now let's weave that together with what Fred was talking about, the old economic paradigm and how the Renaissance is new and Renaissance is happening from a new understanding of economics, also from a quantum perspective. Now, the old economic paradigm was also a transactional paradigm constantly. And we also had to, to believe that um, no pain, no gain, so that we needed suffering and we needed to have the pain, <laughs> and we needed to have the wounding in order to get the gain of awakening and enlightenment. So to me, they are, they are actually on the same order of what needs to shift <laughs> also into this narrative. Now I want to weave in with this, the midwifing. So what does a, what does a, a midwife do? And I'm speaking now as a, as a mother myself, having given birth to two boys. In the mid, the midwife starts to prepare both baby and mother, and she will look for the signals, first of all. First of all, she will see, is the baby in the right position of birth? And remember, when we're taking the birth position, we need to go head down. <laughs> uh, and humans, and this is coming back to your earlier question around the ego, if we want to go through the birth canal with our head up, <laughs> it's like the, the ego <laughs> wants to lead. <laughs> it's going to be very, very painful again. <laughs> so here we see this evolve by choice, not by default. So <laughs> let's take the right position. That's also a position of love, as Urban was talking, of humility, of releasing earlier assumptions. And then to me, now the critical factor for really becoming this new human of this next evolutionary step is that we have to develop the eyes and the ears and the sensory organs that are able to embody that consciousness that emerges from this next evolutionary step. Uh, so that we have, as also has been told in many of, of the, the ancient teachings, wisdom teachings, that you have then the eyes to see and the ears to hear. Yeah? And so this, this new human, this, this next evolutionary step of our future human becoming, therefore, to me, that consciousness is very, very subtle. And if we are caught in the, now coming to your question, in this drama cycle, indeed, uh, wherever there's a drama cycle, wherever there is an addictive behavior, <laughs> we are not consciously participating with the evolutionary process of life. We are on a pattern of default. <laughs> we are on a habitual pattern, an addictive pattern. So to me, the way to get out of this drama cycle, therefore, and therefore to consciously evolve and therefore to take that next step, so we're weaving all of that now together, is to become awake and aware for this very beautiful, subtle consciousness that is, it's like it's whisp whispering into our beings and to that starts by making space for that within ourselves, to making space for that possibility and, and not expect it with a big bang boom <laughs> and everything needing to fall apart. But, and therefore we need an attitude of appreciation and trust. And now to, to nurture this, you know, this little baby infancy of ourselves, it, it doesn't need this big gross consciousness that we had before, but that's really subtle, really, really refined. And if we do that, then we are midwifing and birthing uh, ourselves. And also we are then the ones being born through this process and really working with this beautiful evolutionary process that is now moving us into the birth canal where the wiggle room is getting less. <laughs> so there's no more way to <laughs> play around with this. The planetary boundaries are letting us know, come on, it's time humans. Yeah. We're getting, we ha we're having to now take our position. And as we're taking into our position, there's also the great surrender and the trust to that deeper wisdom and intelligence that now moves us through because we don't move through that by will we move through that by grace beautiful looks like fred is ready to say something off the heels of this i, I fred 
What do you want to say? No, I was just listening and and uh, getting stimulated, and uh, it's just a very big topic about coding and 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 warning. And I don't know how to present in a very simple form. And I'm just thinking, wow, this is a big topic. In fact, this is the topic. So I remember I had a lot of talk with uh, Urban, and he told me, you know, there is this oneness that is the foundation. We always move to coherency. There's this evolutionary force, and nothing we do that we create is from us. It comes from the impulse of this evolutionary force. So your imagination, your thought is not from us. Then I remember in 2019, Sir Penrose finally discovered we have a Wi-Fi system, a microtubular receptor in everybody's house. Because otherwise your neural and chemical system is a cold system. Where the hell you get the universal impulse? So first, there's this coding of reality. This dualistic worth is a perception of reality. It's just a uh, clustering of energy, of consciousness creation that gives you a perception of, of solidity, of matter. It doesn't exist. Everything's a holographic reality. Everything's a projection from the bigger consciousness. And then the nature of consciousness, actually stillness because it doesn't change. But in a dualistic world, everything changes. The only truth is change. And so you have all these coding that goes on. Now to bring in the Eastern culture of creation. We actually have four bodies. There's a physical body and a physical consciousness. And it involves five consciousness of receptors. And then there's a sixth consciousness that are directed by the fifth consciousness, the five receptor into your connective understanding. And it's driven by your desire. And then there's a seventh consciousness. Is a, it is a kind of an operating system like in your hand phone. It is cycles. And then there's eight level consciousness, which is the invisible. So my body has a physical body, an emotional body, a mental body, and then you have an energetic body. The problem is we got lost because we got attracted by the five consciousness, and your sixth consciousness is running with it with desire and perception. And the seventh, you become unconscious like the iceberg, and it's operating you, and you don't know. But there's an eighth consciousness, which is the true things that decide. It's like if we are the hand phone, we think the hand phone, no, 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 no. Then you have the operating system, a hand phone, but it's the Wi-Fi is giving you information. It is the cloud is giving you information. And so we don't understand how this consciousness work in a different level of consciousness that we're in. So there's a coding there. And so the only way we can do is to shift your consciousness. When you become conscious, you're unconscious. Now your operating system change. In the Chinese culture, it's called five, eight, six, seven. You have your information flow coming in. Your great goes into your intuition. You straight go in there, and then you operate a different kind of desire. And that desire doesn't come from it. That desire comes from the driver of your fundamental coding. Now we get traumatized every day. <clears throat> you all heard of nonviolent communication. Every time somebody judge you, you feel damaged. If you count the number of harms and trauma in your life, you'll never clean it one in time. But we all know. If you're Christian or in Chinese, only God can heal you. Only you can heal you. And in consciousness, healing happens. If you don't shift consciousness, you're trying to pick sand. 
out of your eye and try to do all your harm and all your trauma. You never finish. Why? You're living next to the beach. You have to move away living from the beach. Healing happens and no more sand in the eyes. Hmm. Harm can never be healed by picking one at a time. It can only be healed if you massively shift your consciousness and you're not living next to the beach anymore. Hmm. Beautiful. Coding, big topic. We can talk for hours. But for now, <laughs> I hope I address the two questions people put forward. Oh, yes. I want you to feel free to, to talk amongst all of you as well if anybody has other impromptu thoughts here before we wind down with a bit of levity that I, I want to ask all of you about. I, I have a question for everybody. <laughs> <laughs> bringing it all together, the codes, the, the conceptual, yeah, radical inno innovation of some of the thoughts that have been expressed here. Uh, again, I go back to poetry because that holds the question. And it is the, it's just a few short lines that go, not I, not I, but the wind that blows through me. A fine wind is blowing the new direction of time. My question is about that. The fine wind is blowing what kind of new direction of time? We assume it's a subtle thing. We assume that it is part of the mind field of the cosmos that is blowing through us now. What do you see happening as the new direction of time that is that we are being blown through? That's what we don't know, and that's what we are looking for. And the answer is not in the answer, but in the looking. In the looking. Are looking. That is the great, great new element. And that is the source of hope. Because we are asking these questions. You are articulating, Jean, something that people are beginning to ask, that should ask and need to ask. And because they do, there is a search. There is an, a chance that we are beginning to glimpse that light at the end of the tunnel. That's where we need to go. We don't know where we want to go, but we're beginning to understand it intuitively within us, no longer needing to calculate it out. The future, as it has been said, I love to quote this, is not to be forecast, it's to be created. And we are asking questions, which is the way to create the future, because the mind, when it seeks, will find. The Bible said that, Jesus Christ said that, I think all the great courageous people ask. Seek, talk, be open, share. I think that's the way we're beginning to go. And that's why we will make it. That's why my belief. Love that. And, and I will answer as a, a sailor because I'm also a sailor. So we create the sails. <laughs> we adjust our sails to the wind. <laughs> So irrespective of what direction the wind is coming from, if it's a new direction or not, <laughs> we will adjust our sails so that we can now make use of the momentum of that wind. <laughs> so I will respond. It's a very interesting because not a few days ago we had a, a conversation with Deepak Chopper. And so, first of all, if Cosmo is the code, universe is his expression. Mm -hmm. And Gaia's energy is increasing in its frequency and is speeding up. And we live in on Gaia. So within the system, within the system, our energy will shift. And lighter energy is consciousness of a higher level. And the speed of change we can observe. So it is indeed, <clears throat> we are just the expression of the cosmos. But the interesting conversation, uh, which, uh, is with Deepak is the concept of, uh, love, creativity, and surrender is one 
thing. We have desire. We go by the will. It's like selling a sailboat. You got to sail with the wind. You got to use the wind. You got to surrender the wind. You got to surrender to nature, your own nature, nature in general. And so, creativity, love, and surrender comes together. But surrender first, and mm. love and creativity will be present. Surrender to nature. Do not let your desire will drives your life. I think that the wind is in our sails today with this just exquisite conversation amongst all of you, and uh, we really have to wrap up now. But I just want to ask if anybody has any final things to say, or do we leave this? precious little jewel of a conversation as is. Anybody? Okay. I just want to add thank you, Alison, <laughs> for your you insight and bringing us to this point where we can talk to each other and we oh. come course with ideas that perhaps we didn't even know we had. Thanks oh. for moderating. Well, thank you so much. I'm so grateful to all of you and I'm grateful also to the wind because I do believe it's in my back as well, helping to facilitate this. I, I say thank you immensely to this group of midwives today, uh, midwives, avatars, we can say perhaps, and so many other wonderful uh, terms. Uh, I want to thank our hosts, Irvin Lazo and Fred Sow, and our brilliant guests, Genius Houston and Anna Lucid Smitsman, also known as Gene Houston and Anna Luz Smitsman, <laughs> stand-up cosmics, perhaps, of the, of the future? I don't know. <laughs> and I want to thank our worldwide audience as well as our wonderful production team led by Nora Cesar, Kenichi Sugihara, webmaster Fabrizio Beria, and those many wonderful at ITEA Institute. I'm Alison Goldwyn, inviting you to join us for more podcast episodes and to gift a copy of Dawn of an Era of Wellbeing book to yourself or a loved one. It's a wonderful companion during challenging times. From whatever nation state or emotional state you might be in, Dawn of an Era of Wellbeing is the place to tune in. The motto of our ego has historically gotten the better of us, so this time when building that new paradigm for humankind, Let's include human kindness. Stay tuned and stay attuned. Thank you for joining us. Dawn of an Era of Well-Being is a co-production of the Laszlo Institute, ITEA Institute, and Select Books. It's produced by Nora Cesar and Kenichi Sugihara, with theme music Chimera by Piba Dupont. The book, Dawn of an Era of Well-Being, co-authored by Irvin Laszlo and Frederick Sal, is available wherever books or e-books are sold. Please subscribe to Dawn of an Era of Well-Being, the podcast, on Apple or Spotify for more fascinating guests and discussion. My name is Alison Goldwyn, founder and creative director of Synchronistory.com, a future party for the planet broadcast live worldwide, wishing you well-being till we talk again next week. Bye.